to a line chair and beep ba ba beep ba ba boo no, no, Hi, no. I'm talking. It sounds beautiful. Man. Hi everybody, I am Ron Bumblefoot Fall. My early teens, I uh, was playing all the clubs in New York and New Jersey. Uh, kept on going. I was doing. I was always doing solo stuff. Um, I would have a couple of cover bands, and it was always about you know whatever was happening at the time. As a kid, growing up mid to late seventies, classic rock was it. Uh, you couldn't. A day didn't go by that something amazing musically wasn't happening. Here's a new album from Led Zeppelin. Next week, here's a new album from Queen. You know things like that, and you could not avoid inspirational, incredible music. So, grew up with that. And then, as styles change, a big part of that is the technology that drives new sounds. So, as amps got a little heavier and things happen, and people, you know, also socially, the world changes and people have a new voice and a new thing that they need to say. And what you were saying five years ago is no longer, you can't say it's not relevant, but it's just not, current is not what's happening right now and there's that so music started the rock started getting a little heavier you know you had bands like UFO which were right on that that middle ground between classic rock and metal and then sure enough you're browsing a record store for the first time and you see Iron Maiden and, and you see an album cover and you ask the guy it's like is this any good and he's like take it home try it and you hear it and you're just blown away, instant Maiden fan. And from there on, it's all about old school metal. Uh, growing up and watching all these new bands come out, uh, I remember when Queensryche just had the EP and hearing that and then how it grew into Warning and Rage for Order and they were like the Pink Floyd of metal, doing things that, was, that were never done before. Um, if you go back and listen, it's incredible the things that they were doing sound-wise that was so ahead of its time. Uh, and it continued from there. And then you have all these different scenes that are emerging. You have the, you know, the glam scene, the hair band scene, all of that, which really, you know, they got it from early 70s glam and they just took it to the next level. So now you had all these bands like Wasp and Rat and all these things in the early going into mid 80s. So, you know, I remember having my little TV in my room and bending this wire hanger and trying to rig it up with all this tin foil and doing whatever I could to get a UHF signal and there was this channel U68 and the U68 power hour every night at 11 and just watching all these bands. I remember seeing Kicks for the first time which a few years later ended up opening for them with my band. And that's the interesting thing when you start to actually connect to all these bands that you're seeing. You're watching them as a fan and then you're opening for them and then it gets really weird when you start playing with them and that starts to happen. And that's when you start looking back at life and, and saying, you start thinking of that, that little five-year-old kid that heard Kiss Alive for the first time. And if you could go back and ask him, say, do you think you'll ever be jamming with Ace Frehley and Peter Chris? They're like, no, you know, but it happened. I was 12 years old and I would paint Iron Maiden albums on the backs of dungaree jackets for about $20 a pop so that I could save up and buy gear. That's how it is sometimes. They know you by your, your they don't know your face, they don't, but it's something else, it's some accessory that you might have. This thing or, <laughs> or a certain guitar. Like now I have this double neck guitar that has a fretless neck on top. It's the main thing I use for everything. Uh, so I think more people will recognize me just, if I have that guitar, they'll know, oh yeah, the guy that plays that guitar, that kind of thing, which is fine because it's all about the music. You want people to know the music. I don't matter, as long as the music is there and people know that, that's what counts. I think what happens most of the time is that you have a kind of music and it's a big statement, uh, it's a cultural statement. 
and people are just living it and it's very real for them and it's it's everything for them and then what happens is it gets invested in and it blows up and it gets oversaturated to the point that it starts losing some of the charm and people get a little worn out on it in the 80s Everybody was partying, all was good, and then in the 90s we're tightening the belt, and the next thing you know, everybody's in flannel, and, and it's not about that, you know, it's about, you know, it's about our problems a little more, and talking about our, you know, those feelings, it's not all about the party, the party, I think people got tired of that, and they needed to get into something that felt a little more, uh, just a little deeper and a, less on the surface. And people shouldn't ride this wagon of, that's not cool anymore. That's not how it is, it's just that's not being invested in anymore. That's not being promoted and pushed anymore. That's what, not what the industry is signing anymore because one guy decided to take the first step in the other direction and everybody followed. And that's just how it works. But it never goes away. Once something exists, it is there forever and there is no erasing it. And nothing can make people unlove it. So everything that happened in the hairband days, people still love it and when it comes on, it makes you reminisce, it brings you right back to it. It's a soundtrack to a part of your life. It was not ever something I was looking to do to join someone else's band. If you're a fan of a band, the last thing you want to do is break up that family and interject yourself into it. Uh, you want to enjoy it for what it is, that's why you love it. Uh, because that is a specific combination of ingredients that will never be the same if you change anything, and it's special. Uh, people ask me, would you ever want to join KISS? I was like, no, no, I want it to be what it was. That's what made it magical. You know, would you want to join the Beatles? Would you like to replace John Lennon in the Beatles back then? No, because they wouldn't be the Beatles, and they were so perfect and magical and gave so much to the universe. Can't mess with that. So there were a lot of bands that were like that. When you know a band on a first name basis, you know, Peter, Ace, Gene, Paul, uh, John Paul, George Ringo, uh, Axel Slash, Duff, Izzy, Steven, you know, all those bands, there's something special and that's it. And nothing will be the same. Out of nowhere, uh, Joe Satriani hits me up, he's like, hey man, they're, they're looking for a new guitar player to replace Bucket, and I, I recommended you, so if they get in touch, just so you know. And at the time, I didn't know what they were doing, I didn't know where they were, and what their plans were, or anything. So, it's like, oh cool, well, you know, thank you. And a few hours later, someone got in touch from the band, and sent me this funny email, and I wrote them back, and I was like, yeah, I'd love to spread the love, let's, let's get to, let's talk. And we spent about two months talking, and, and there was a lull, and we'll call it a lull. And <laughs> a year and a half later, they had a tour lined up. Uh, we were back in touch with each other, and we got together in New York, brought my guitar, we jammed to three songs. And I said, cool, you want to jam another three? I was like, yeah, I know those already, because who doesn't know the whole Appetite album and a half of Illusions? If you're a guitar player and you play rock music, there are certain songs that if you don't know it, you need to hang it up. You know, these are just, that's how it is. There's certain things that if you don't know it, you didn't do your homework, you don't live it, it's not in your blood, it's not in your DNA, go home. So, they said, do you want to do these three songs? Like, yeah, I already know. See you tomorrow. And get together, we jam. We ended up jamming seven times and then hit the road for three months. Uh, the tricky part of it was the Chinese Democracy album because they didn't want that leaking out. They didn't know me yet or anything. They don't know if they could trust me. I'm a stranger to them. So they're not going to give me a copy of the album. They're not giving me a copy to learn these songs. But I had to learn half the album, which was all demos at that point. So I had to listen with pen and paper on the road manager's laptop with headphones in the other room while the band waited for a half hour and learned half the album, just listening through once or twice and then get back in the room and we played and hit the road like that. So there were challenges, but I like challenges. I like going after the impossible. Something that seems like, how is this ever gonna work? How is this gonna happen? That's when you go for it.